Dear kind and gracious Heavenly Father, I come to you at the beginning of this service to ask your blessing upon all of us that are here and that your spirit will be here with us and that you'll add your blessing to the words which Tom will speak to us and it'll be what we need to hear and that we'll see your message and plan within that, within that sermon and in Jesus' most holy name, amen. themes for the ironic moment is he dwelleth within us and when I was preparing for this I was kind of having a hard time because I said man there's so many things that you can say about that theme and I had a uh, thing pop up in my Facebook news feed that was one of those uh, feel good stories that I thought would be appropriate to share and there's this uh, coffee shop that's out in the name of the town escapes me. It's out in Washington, just this little tiny town. And it's a, about this lady who runs a coffee shop. And she had this, this man that came by who has uh, several disabilities, cerebral palsy and a couple others. I can't remember what they are. But <clears throat> he came up and she felt that he had a special uh, being about him. And he was just, she said that he was one of those few people that you could tell that actually had a pure heart. And so she kept inviting him back and said, you know, if you want to stop by every day. Uh, you talk to me for a couple hours and I'll make you a drink. It's, a, it's, you know, different flavor of coffee each time he came by. Well, the word got out around the town that she was doing this and they threw a birthday party for this guy. And the reason that I wanted to share that story is because the love that she had for this person that she didn't really know was something that was beautiful because she recognized a pure heart inside of him. And I don't know if the lady has any kind of faith that never mentioned that, but she showed a love towards him that I believe that God shows, shows towards all of us. <clears throat> and the suggested scripture for the ironic moment today is out of 1 John chapter 4, verses 11 through 17. It's kind of lengthy, so please bear with me. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time except them who believe. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and in his love, in his love is perfected in us. Hereby we know that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known that believed, and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. And that those few scriptures have so much meaning with what's going on in the world today. We see so much hatred and malcontent towards one another that if we just did the simple thing and turned to God and brought God back into ourselves, we could show everybody that perfect love that is God. Heavenly Father, I come to you at this point in the service to ask a blessing upon the funds that will be collected and upon the people that will give and those who wish to give that may not have the opportunity to at this time. And I pray that the funds will be put to a good use in, in your church and the people that you've put in charge of them. 
and in your son's most holy name, amen. For scripture reading, I've chosen uh, two to share with you, looking at the uh, culmination of the theme for the month, because we love the Lord, we seek to be an example. In today's theme, we should be in the world, but not of it. These are the two opening scriptures I've chosen for you. From the 12th chapter of Romans, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what that good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. And then I chose a short scripture from Matthew 7. And uh, at the beginning of my sermon, you'll see uh, how this fits in. Starting on the uh, 24th uh, verse, chapter 7, Matthew. And again, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. For do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them.
Judith and Diana, we appreciate your ministry and music this morning. It's beautiful. It's like today. It's a beautiful day. And it's a great opportunity to be here with each and every one of you. A number of years ago, matter of fact, a large number of years ago, I went home one day and I said, I found a job. And my mom and dad said, oh, you found a job? And I go, I found a job. And I'd gone up to Safeway and they said, we don't need any more boys. And I went down to Kroger's and they said, well, you can fill an application out. And uh, later in December of that year, I got a phone call. Uh, Do you want a job? And I said, I want a job. Come to work, wear a white shirt, blue jeans, and we'll give you a little black bow tie. That was really cute. A little bitty black bow tie we got to wear. And that was my first job. And uh, I have to say that was probably my last job because I've never gone out of the grocery business after 52 years. I spent all these years, you know, pushing groceries one way or another. And so this morning I thought, what an appropriate way as I move toward my end of my career, I'm hoping, to share with you some fruit. And that's where Matthew 7 you know, becomes very important to what I'm going to do here this morning. I went and, uh, yes, I purchased these, Jim. I I bought these, okay? I just want you to know these. Okay, these are, that's why they're so nice. They look good, you know, but uh, these out here. Now, as I grew in the grocery business, I found that This is what's called a red delicious apple. And in the produce business, there are many, many varieties of apples and fruits and all kinds of things. And there's very uh, many qualities. There's what's called an extra fancy apple, a fancy apple, a good apple, and not so good okay but it looks really good doesn't it look good looks really good but i'm gonna tell you it's not is this celestial glory is this terrestrial glory is this telestial glory what would this be Ooh, not good looks good and doesn't the adversary always make things look really good to us Of course. And if you were from a a long distance away and you were looking at these, you'd go, celestial glory looks almost as good as this. But what you don't see sometimes when we're blinded by the mist of life is a fact. And as you turn this over, you go, wow, that's rotten to the core. That's sometimes what happens to us in life. We see all these things that are acceptable and we get blinded by what's going on and we miss what really is what we call rotten to the core. And as my mother taught me, there's a saying for everything and hers would be, did you know one bad apple spoils the whole barrel. And I can tell you, I thought about that all my life and being in the grocery business all my life. Is that a true statement? Yes, it is. It is a true statement because I can tell you that if we leave these three apples over here and we put the bad apple with those, soon these three will be rotten also. So today, I want to take time and kind of tie up the whole month. We have uh, had preaching services and we have had prayer services uh, all this month. And we've talked a lot about we should seek to be a good example. 
And today's theme is we should be in the world, but not of it. So I would like uh, to share with you, you know, many things. A fact of life. We're all going to die. This is our probationary period. This is a time that we prepare to meet God. Some will die young. Some will make it to middle age. Some of us will make it to old age. But we're all appointed a time. Now, as you look over your life, whether you're eight years old, 18, 58, or 88, how are you going to be remembered? And how do you want to be remembered in your life? Will you be known as a uh, great businessman? The very best vice president of the company? A CEO? Or maybe you'll be known as a great architect? Or a wonderful physician? Or will you, will you be known by uh, the letters after your name? Whether it's uh, BA, BS, PhD, whatever it may be. So let me uh, pick out a few people out of the Bible. How are great men such as uh, the Pharaoh remembered as? How about uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Pilate? These all were men of great estate, of great esteem in their worlds. But they weren't really good men. Now, how about these men? These men were not men of great title. Moses, wow, he had a hard time speaking, you know, complete sentences or babbling, and he had probably a speech impediment. Daniel, and of course, our Lord Jesus Christ. These men were men of great testimony. And my question for all of us is, how will we be known? Will we be known as those great businessmen? Or will we be known as people with great testimonies? So the first thing today is that when you participate in building God's kingdom, you need to be a people of a good example with a good testimony. As believers, we need to be sure that we don't become spiritually complacent. And what I mean by that, we have knowledge. We have much wisdom. But sometimes we can get lazy and we can get stale. And sometimes in our daily living, we become afraid that somebody might make fun of us. Wow. I'm going to share about Jesus and about the love that he has for each one of us and about my testimony of how I know that he works in each one of our lives. Should we be afraid of that? I hope not. We as his servants need to have an intense desire that saturates our whole being and compels us to pursue him in all our aspects of our lives. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 3.8 said, I count all things, but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but done, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So as good examples, we need to have the passion, the passion to know him. So if someone asks you, who is Jesus Christ? What are you going to say to him? Well, that's somebody in the Bible. That's somebody that people talk about. If you turn to channel 363, you can hear all about him. Now it's time that we tell the facts that we know. 
that he was born of a virgin. He grew, was crucified. He was buried and he rose again to save each one of us from, from death. We need to share that person, that personal testimony that he is the risen Christ. The most important thing that's in our lives. We should have a personal and intimate relationship with the Lord. So how do we do that? How do we develop a personal relationship with the Lord? R S O and not the place where you shop down here in independence. Read the word, study the word, and obey the word. Because you're only going to improve yourself if you know what you're talking about. And the only way you're going to get that is by study. So one of the things that came up in the priesthood assembly that Fred Larson brought up, he talked a little about, about the epitome of faith. And I can remember back in the 70s and 80s and 90s and a lot of times we talked about that all the time. And I'll be real frank, I can't remember hearing much about it lately. So if you haven't, have this little sheet that says what we believe, then you need to find it again and read it. Because um, I'm going to just pick out one paragraph without even... Uh, looking for what I say. We believe that in the Bible is contained the word of God. We believe that the canon of scripture is not full, but that God by his spirit will continue to reveal his word, word to man until the end of time. There is much, much knowledge in this and things that we should know right off when somebody asks you, what do you believe? If you can't answer that right off, you need to get this out, you need to read it, and you need to work on memorizing it, what you believe. Now, I'm going to tell you what. Those that are on this side, they know what Satan believes, just the opposite of what celestial kingdom believes. So I'm saying, if you want to prepare to fight against this, you need to be prepared over here on this side. We must be observant to all the laws in our daily lives. Our lives are an example of this church in his ways. About 17, 18 years ago, I was working down in High V at 23rd Street, and I gave this testimony on Wednesday night, and I was dealing with some of the other teammates in the store. You never know who's listening. Because uh, in the next week, uh, somebody let me know that I heard you talking to those people. And it happened to be Mert Bowerman. And I said, oh, it's a good thing I was being Have. And uh, I was, uh, I was, uh, my wife made fun of my being Have. But it's an example is that we're out there on the front line all the time as believers and members of this church. You're right there in front of people. And if you're using that bad language or you're doing the things that are not right, if you're not being the good steward, I'm gonna tell you that that finger is gonna point back at you saying, well, you know, you talk a good game, but you're not <coughs> walking the walk. So we need to make sure that we're doing these things. We, the way we live our lives testifies to others our commitment to the Lord. If you're committed, then you live your life that way. If you're not committed, then don't live your life that way. Look at the core. That's what happens. We are examples to everyone that we work around, we live around, we fellowship around. We can show others how the love of God works in every circumstances. And of course, we cannot live in deliberate sin and follow Jesus Christ and know Jesus Christ. We must lay aside everything that competes with uh, our love for Jesus, loyalty, devotion, 
is to him, not to the things of the world. We need to have passion to obey the Lord. Have you ever said, Lord, I will be obedient to you regardless of the consequences? Or do we say, I want to obey God? Wanting to obey and making a commitment are two different things. We can make repeated decisions to be obedient without ever making the final, most crucial resolution to obey no matter what. There can be no reservations. Isaiah says, learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they should be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you should be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. We, we need to be just totally committed to obey him. We need to walk with him in spirit. The Lord will assume all the responsibility If you do what he says, he's bound. Section 81 of the Doctrine and Covenants houses that. I, the Lord, am bound when you do what I say. Now, he's not going to tell you bad things to do, folks. He's going to tell you the things that you should be doing. And that's why he would be bound to it. Because those are good things in life. Those are the things that we should we should be doing. Have you read the uh, Great Commission recently? Know what the Great Commission is? Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always until the end of the world. Most of the people will say, man, you guys in the priesthood are very busy. And I'm saying back, okay, I don't expect some of you to go out and baptize because that's not uh, some uh, people's position to do. That's the, that's the priesthood. But there's no reason why everyone in this church can't go out and talk to other people and offer their testimony about the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost and tell them about the goodness of Jesus Christ and what he's done for each one of us. I would challenge all of us that we should go and share, share our testimony with these people. Do you realize there are people in the world that have not heard of Jesus Christ? Society has changed. The world has changed. A lot of us grew up and pretty strict families. And then the next generation wasn't as strict, and then the next generation wasn't as strict as that, and then we have evolved into where a lot of the things that people my age look back and say, wow, we didn't, none of that was going on when we grew up, and it does now. So things have changed. Now how are we gonna change it back? The way we change it back is being valiant soldiers of Jesus Christ. Offer up our testimonies to the priesthood members from Doctrine and Covenants. You are sent forth to be taught. Not, you are not sent forth to be taught, but to teach the children of men things which I have put in your hands with the power of my spirit. You are to be taught from on high. So sanctify yourselves and you shall be endowed with power that you may give even as I have spoken. So there is great power that comes with these things. We're not out there by ourselves. The Lord has told us. He doesn't give us any more than what we can handle. And again, he is bound if we do what he says. So he's not going to turn his back on us. 
We have got to uh, be actively participating in the preaching of the gospel. How many times do you feel comfortable, uncomfortable, or embarrassed when uh, someone laughs at you about your beliefs? How many times are you uncomfortable about sharing your beliefs? I can tell you I've been in situations where no one knew that I was a preacher. No one knew where I went to church with a group of people and uh, have them start talking about religion and then kind of look at me like, wow, you're a strange guy. It's not time to be quiet. It's time to lift up your voice and become active speaking and challenging and in taking it upon ourselves not to stay quiet. Remember, the Lord was crucified. He rose again that we might have eternal life. We should have his name on our lips frequently. We should have him in our prayers continuously. And we should share that testimony of him and bring others to Christ. The Lord came down out of heaven where he was worshiped by concourses of angels and he could be there and he could have been there forever and ever and ever, but he chose a different path. He chose to came down to give his life that we might have everlasting life. He gave us that precious gift, everlasting life. So are we good servants? Listen to what Paul said and listen to the sufferings he went through. And then think about the sufferings that we've gone through. Paul said, of the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes, save one. I've never been whipped, well, but my, but by my dad, you know, you know, fathers, fathers are like that. Uh, but I certainly didn't get 40 stripes from him. Uh, thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a day, night and a day have I been in the deep, in journeyings often, in peril of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils of the wilderness, <clears throat> in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness. Wow. And we get upset that the electricity went off, or the air didn't work right, or the heat's not on, or the internet's off. Paul had a great passion to serve Jesus Christ. Yes, he experienced hunger, cold, exposure, prison, beatings, shipwrecks in order to be a faithful servant. Why was he able to endure all these things? Paul was motivated by the gratitude and vision for God's great purpose. He knew the love that Jesus has for each of us. Now we may not, and we may endure great sufferings like Paul, but we will experience trials that will bring us closer to Jesus Christ. And God's desire is that we have lifestyles that glorifies him so that the world might know Jesus Christ as the savior. And we need to reach out to all, to all people with the assurance that our words and ways are Christ's words and ways. And he calls us to be good examples of him. We need to continually glorify God. Our purpose is to live exemplary lives. And why does not an exemplary life about Jesus Christ point others to Christ? Yes, it does. Many of us uh, may live a life of prestige and prominence and fame and fortune. Some will not. Lehi's vision spoke of many of those that had wonderful, easy, great, prominent lives. 
And he pointed out that there's a great and spacious building in his vision that's full of those people. And they looked down upon those that were traveling the straight and narrow path to the tree of life. And they scoffed at those people. And they pointed at them. They made fun of them. That's the world we live in. And it's not going to change. It's only going to get worse. So if people have made fun of you and they pointed at you because of your beliefs, then you're on the right path. And you hold on to that rod of iron with the word of God and he will take you uh, with the holding on to that iron, rod of iron to that tree. And no matter if the mists come up or whatever happens in life, you will have the assurity that he is there with you. So really, the only thing in life is really preparation to meet God. I know there's a lot of distractions. We all have them. They're everywhere. As a teenager, I remember discussing with some of my friends in junior high, now they call it middle school, about uh, our church and about the Rock of Revelation. And I pointed out the, the scripture. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, some say John the Baptist. Some say Elias. And some said Jeremiah and, or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said to him, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, for flesh and blood have not revealed this unto thee, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, the rock of revelation, I will build my church in the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So to be a good example of Jesus Christ, do you not need to know his doctrine? Do you not need to know his beliefs? You need to know all these things because there will come a time, a challenge to you by someone or many others about your beliefs. And if you don't stand upon that rock and know these things, that wind's going to come up and those rains are going to come and that sandy foundation you're built on is going to wash right down the river. But if we build upon the rock, which is Jesus Christ, and know his doctrine, we will be distinguished from others. So I learned from this experience when I was a young man that one of the greatest distinguishing things in our belief is that of revelation. What church has a current prophet that brings forth revelation to today's world? This is it. This is it. This is the distinctive difference. And if you don't realize it and you don't believe it, you need to believe it and realize it because it's true that the prophet Fred brings forth the word of God. And yes, he's a man. And yes, he makes mistakes, but he is, he is the one that brings forth the word. And we need to support him all together as one to support him and to feast on the words that he brings, the words of the revelations that he brings and he has brought forth have much to do with the world of today.
Well, I'm not going to get completely done. <laughs> I'm going to skip over to um, a couple of things. And I'm going to just, you know, remind us that God, God isn't something that's far away. He isn't like way out there. The Lord that we serve isn't way in the distance. He isn't a silent deity. He is one that communicates us to us just like he has at the beginning of time. He has brought forth revelation to men in the very beginning, all along. And yes, there is a period of time at apostasy that we went several hundred years without really the word of the Lord being brought. But in, the, in 1830, that was changed. When it was restored upon the earth, his church and the revealment of his word to each one of us. He loves each one of us, and he desires an intimate relationship. He wants to bond with us. He wants to continue to give us guidance. And we need his wisdom. We need his counsel. We need it more now than ever. Our country has been torn to shreds over the last 50 years. It used to be you could believe in something that was good and you could stand up and say, I believe in the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost and I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. And now people laugh at you or there are other religions that don't believe that Jesus is the Christ and they are the Antichrist and there's billions of people in this world that do not accept Jesus as the Christ. And I tell you that we need the strength of Jesus and the revealment of his word through our prophet. He speaks to us, the Lord does, and he brings truth to our souls and he brings comfort and assurance to each one of us. So I'm coming down to the end. I said a lot of things this morning, but I want to be, bring everything to a culmination for this month. We want to be good examples. You can't be good examples if you don't open up your scriptures. You cannot be good examples examples if you don't obey the scriptures. RSO. If you're not following that, and that's really easy for me to remember. Just read, study, obey. You have to know what you're talking about. So let's say that we all know what we're talking about now. And we go and we share our testimonies to others. So it leads me to the end today. And this is called Feed My Sheep. Imagine, if you will, on a Friday evening, you've just finished a great dinner. You're settling back in the warm embrace of your lazy boy recliner contemplating no greater dilemma than whether to read a book, watch a movie, or see what's on TV. And the phone rings. You're startled, but you're curious. You better answer the call. So you answer the call, and your soul is delighted to hear the voice of your dear friend on the other end. He tells you he has to be gone just for a while. But could you care for his sheep while he's gone? Just feed and care for the flock until he returns. Oh, but of course you will. He's your best friend. You love this man. 
you live, love him like he's, he's your brother. There's no job too much that he can ask you to do. Just, just leave it to me. I will stand in for you while you're away and you'll find the sheep fed and well cared for when you return. Now, after you retire to your bedroom, you remember your promise. Mm, well, <laughs> that's going to be, that's going to require some big changes in your life starting tomorrow. From now on, you ponder, you'll be rising a little earlier to do your shepherding duties. Maybe you have to study up on those sheep and how to care for them. <clears throat> what do you find, feed sheep? Maybe the young ones require different food from the older ones. The lambs, do they get milk? What things do you keep the flock, how, what things do you do to keep the flock safe? How can you keep the wolves out? What other predators try to sneak in? How will you keep them safe in the dark of the night? You begin to realize what a big responsibility this flock is. But you hear his voice and he's saying, feed my sheep. But how long will he be gone? What does he really expect of you? And the weeks wear on and on. And you find some of the sheep are really lovable. But then there are some you find completely unresponsive. Yet you know they are also valuable to your friend and he loves each one of them. And of course, there are a few that try to stray. And you do your best to try to keep them in line. Your mind goes back to your friend. He would always reach out and he search out those lost ones. And he would gently carry them back in his loving arms to rejoin their family. Remembering the love he had for each one, you know that you too must diligently seek those who have strayed. No matter what the weather, no matter what other important business there is to tend to, no matter that you are tired. When you are discouraged and tired, you think back over the years and you recall the great sacrifices your friend has made for you. In reality, you can't think of a single time that he let you down. No, because you promised him to care for his sheep until he returned. You must continue. In your mind's eye, you see his face. It's full of love. It's full of love for you. It's full of love for his sheep. And you realize the joy he will have when he returns and see his flock, having been fed and cared for, and he will know that it was done day after day because you love him, the dearest friend you've ever had. Jesus said, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith it to him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again, the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he saith it to him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he say unto him, Feed my sheep. And he saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Just like sheep, we all come in different sizes, shapes, 
colors, ages. Each of us have a unique personality that calls for certain special care. Some are touched by tenderness, while others might have a need to receive the counsel of kindness. Whatever the situation calls for, the need must be met by the love of Christ that is within each of us. Will you tend to his flock? Will you feed his sheep? Father who art in heaven, I come to you now to ask a prayer of benediction upon this service. Father, I pray that you would take these words that were brought to us and etch them on our hearts that we will desire to be that fruit to the world, that ensign to the world that you call us to be, that we'll be that we could live to be that example that people would desire to be with you and to build thy kingdom. We love you, Lord, and we give you all praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' most precious and holy name, amen. I do have a couple of announcements. Any of the corrections or updates that you would like us to make in the...